Good afternoon or evening, whenever this is being presented. I'm John Craig, Division Chief of Rhinology and Endoscopic Skull Base Surgery at Henry Ford. I'll be talking about this topic, embracing the pain, evaluating the elusive sinus headache. First off, we see patients like this every day, and they've often read a source, something like this, perhaps WebMD, and if they read far enough down, they'll see the buildup of pressure in your sinuses can cause a headache. Also, they might search on YouTube or other social media outlets and find news stories of people who've had their headaches cured by sinus surgery or other remedies. And unfortunately, these are not good evidence sources, as we know, but this is how patients come to our visits with preconceived notions, and this is an issue. So why does it all matter? Well, first off, this is very common. Uh, patients present to primary care physicians as well as otolaryngologists frequently for headache. The delay of diagnosis can result in prolonged patient suffering. Unnecessary antibiotic, steroid, or other sinus over-the-counter therapies. Unnecessary sinus surgery. And of course, increased healthcare costs. And this has been shown in multiple studies. So here's our outline for the rest of the talk. First off, what is a sinus headache? What do people mean? What is rhinosinusitis? How do we define it? And what's a headache caused by rhinosinusitis? How might we diagnose these patients? And finally, we'll end on just a few treatment options, but I admit most of this talk will be on diagnosis, and so this will be a very brief section. Let's get into it. First off, terminology. Yes, we all know sinus headache is a misleading term because rhinosinusitis is an uncommon cause of craniofacial pain. However, this point has been iterated and reiterated in decades of literature, and yet the, the term is still going strong in the media, amongst patients, and even clinicians, so I think there's little, little point in fighting it. For this talk, I generally use non-sinogenic craniofacial pain or facial pain, but we just have to accept that people will continue to call these sinus headaches or pressure and figure out what they actually mean. So we're just going to hit a touch of physiology here, very basic. We all know V1 and V2 carries various pain fibers. These supply via bare nerve terminals, the sinonasal mucosa, something like this simple diagram. Local stimulation of these trigeminal fibers presumably lead to an afferent response to the brain, i.e. pain, and an efferent response of vasodilation and hypersecretion, which lead to the other sinonasal symptoms. Therefore, presumably, sinus inflammation or other types of mucosal pressure changes can stimulate these nerve fibers and elicit pain. That's all we've got for physiology. So let's start off just defining rhinosinusitis. And I know uh, you're going to get another talk on chronic rhinosinusitis, so I'm just going to hit on this briefly. This is based on 2015 American Academy of Otolaryngology and the 2020 European Position Statement Guidelines. First off, what is rhinosinusitis? This is inflammation and or infection in the sinuses that cause symptoms. You have to have two or more of these symptoms. And here are the five cardinal symptoms, anterior, posterior nasal drainage, nasal obstruction, smell loss, and last there you see cheek or forehead pressure. Now, an important point pertinent to our talk, you can't diagnose rhinosinusitis based on facial pain alone. You have to have an associated symptom that's been specified to be either anterior drainage or nasal obstruction. I think that's a very key point. So then we talk about acute being less than one month of symptoms. Recurrent just means multiple discrete episodes of less than one month. Chronic is greater than three months. And so those are symptomatic subjective criteria. You need objective criteria in the form of endoscopic findings like edema, pus, or polyps generally in the middle meatus but it could be other sinus pathways. CT findings, mucosal thickening or opacification. So if you have symptomatic and at least one of those uh, objective criteria, you've got rhinosinusitis. Now, how about pain or headache attributed to rhinosinusitis according to International Headache Society guidelines? And uh, most recently in 2018, the ICHD3 came out. This talks about two different forms of headache attributed to rhinosinusitis, either acute or ARS or CRS, which is chronic rhinosinusitis, or recurrent acute sinusitis, okay? And I won't go through all these bullet points. The key points is point B, you need to be able to diagnose rhinosinusitis like we showed on the previous side, clinical, uh, subjective, and objective findings. And then you just need a temporal uh, association between the headache and the sinusitis. As the sinusitis gets worse, the pain should get worse. As the sinusitis resolves, the pain should resolve. Now, some interesting point here, uh, the point about exacerbating the headache by putting pressure over the paranasal sinus. Now, I personally am not aware of any original research justifying this. In fact, I was taught, and I know I teach my residents, that this is not a predictive uh, sign. And so uh, I think we need to take that with a grain of salt and needs to be studied better in the future. 
Lastly, if you have unilateral pain, this should be confirmed as ipsilateral rhinosinusitis. Okay, so that's how we define it. But there are some issues here. First, neither of these documents, um, as nice as they are, they don't describe or discuss the original research published generally showing a low or variable prevalence of craniofacial pain in rhinosinusitis. Secondly, neither discusses the optimal diagnostic methods for determining whether facial pain is due to rhinosinusitis or a headache disorder, only that it can be either. So which one's better, nasal endoscopy or imaging? Therefore, clinicians must go by either their training or interpretations of these relatively vague guidelines. It can be a problematic, it can be problematic. So if a patient presents with sinus headaches, what's the most common diagnosis? I think we've all heard these stories from uh, landmark papers like this, Schreiber 2004, prospective multi-center trial, uh, multi-center study, almost 3,000 patients, 88% had migraine or probable migraine based on criteria back then. Eros in 2007, prospective observational study of 100 sequential patients with sinus headache, 86% with migraine or probable migraine. And this has been shown in other studies too, but in more recent years, a little less migraine. And we wanted to look at this too, and I'll go over this study in more detail uh, in subsequent slides, but uh, we had 134 consecutive sinus headache patients and we saw 50% migraine, still the most common, but I think a key point is 95% were non-sinogenic, okay? And so are there other types of non-sinogenic facial pain other than migraine? Absolutely. First, second most common in most studies and in our study, tension type headache, cluster headache, hemicrania continua, cervicogenic headache, trigeminal neuralgia, occipital neuralgia, medication overuse headache, myofascial pain syndrome, fibromyalgia, and yes, there are more. If you're well-versed in the ICHD3 criteria, you can tease out these different headaches, but otherwise, if you're like me, really consider a neurology or headache specialist if you think it's not sinogenic. So why is this so confusing? You know, if we know that 80 or so percent of patients have migraine, shouldn't it be straightforward? Not quite. So multiple headache disorders, especially migraine and tension headache, <clears throat> cause pain over the cheeks, forehead, temples, and these are often interpreted as sinuses. Some migraine triggers even include allergen exposure, barometric pressure, or seasonal changes. You can see how this could be interpreted as sinus pain. Patients with headache disorders often have concurrent sinonasal symptoms that therefore could even give them a symptomatic diagnosis of rhinosinusitis. And then some facial pain patients have both sinusitis and headache disorders. You can see how all this works against us making the diagnosis. So let's go to some of the literature on this. Schreiber, 2004, <clears throat> looked at uh, nearly 3,000 patients with migraine. And here are the concurrent symptoms with migraine. You can see uh, nasal obstruction and rhinorrhea occur in 40 to 60% of the patients with migraine. Lal et al. in 2013, 211 facial pressure patients, 70 to 90% of them had at least one or more sinonasal symptoms, 50% or more of them had migraine. Terribly concurrent are these sinonasal symptoms with migraine. How about uh, the concurrence of sinusitis and headache disorders? So Lal, uh, their group in 2013, retrospective review of 211 facial pressure patients, 70%, yes, had some form of rhinosinusitis, 50% had a primary headache disorder, 30% had concurrent rhinosinusitis and a headache disorder. So nearly a third of these patients with sinus headache are going to have both. More confusing points. If we just look at symptomatic criteria for rhinosinusitis, there's only about a 50 to 70% positive and negative predictive value in predicting the rhinosinusitis unless you employ objective criteria. Well, as we said before, sinusitis and headache guidelines do not provide clear recommendations for the optimal objective confirmatory testing, whether that be imaging or endoscopy, making this significantly more confusing. So that brings us to the discussion of objective criteria. Which one should we use? Let's talk about CTs first. So this is a patient I saw recently, absolutely miserable with their sinuses, multiple antibiotics a year for five years, based on severe pressure in the forehead and between the eyes, no other symptoms. Someone got a CT scan, here's the coronal, showing bilateral ethmoid partial opacification or mucosal thickening, some left maxillary sinus mucosal thickening. Uh, this is, of course, read as possible chronic rhinosinusitis. So now the patient has the read saying they have sinusitis, years and years of antibiotics. They are now justified in thinking that they have sinusitis-related pain, but of course, this is misleading and problematic. 
Why should we view CTs with caution? Well, multiple studies, this is just a, a small handful. Multiple have shown 30 to 80% of the general population or specifically migraine patients have incidental sinus findings on sinus or head CT or MRI. This can be cysts, mucosal thickening, partial opacification or mucus. And then secondly, CT findings do not correlate well with sinonasal symptoms or specifically facial pain. This is just a couple of these studies on facial pain in patients with rhinosinusitis, 2003 here, 51 patients with rhinosinusitis. They looked at pain scores versus the CT opacification score, no correlation at all with CT burden of disease. Another nice study here in 2016, 83 CRS patients, multi-center prospective trial, <clears throat> pain scores taken at pain locations in the face specified there. They looked at and compared to CTO pacification scores. Lo and behold, no correlation again between location and severity. So positive findings don't help us a whole lot in this situation. What about negative results? Well, they might not help either because for one, if patients truly have recurrent acute sinusitis, which is a common presentation for their facial pain, recurrent episodes. Well, if the CT is timed wrong and it's not obtained during episodes, it could be false and negative. A negative CT also does not give patients a diagnosis. While it does make some clinicians, and I remember myself feeling better that maybe we're not missing something when we see a, a negative CT, it's extremely unlikely that you're going to miss something by scoping a patient because these patients normally always have prominent sinonasal symptoms on the history and they'll be detectable on nasal endoscopy. In reality, these patients with craniofacial pain really should be considered for neuroimaging according to specific headache criteria rather than sinus imaging to confirm sinusitis. Me personally, I defer this to our neurologists, but honestly, the listeners may be more up to date on neuroimaging criteria, and that's totally appropriate. But I think the key is we're looking for headache conditions, not so much sinus conditions. Okay, so what about nasal endoscopy? Well, what is it? For those not familiar with this, basically we have a, a rigid or a flexible scope that we place in the nasal cavity between the nasal septum and the turbinates. And we're looking mainly at the middle meatus, which is this space lateral. I don't know if you can see my arrow here, but lateral to the middle turbinate on the left side of the screen. There's no edema there, no pus. That's a normal scope or negative. Here's a positive scope on the right side. I forgot to mention that, uh, the other picture to the right side as well. We see edema and mucopurulence where you see the white asterisk there. That is a positive scope. Here's another positive scope for polyps in a patient with chronic rhinosinusitis. These are the positive and negative imaging findings we're looking for with endoscopy. So what's the utility of endoscopy? Well, there's really nice meta-analysis that came out last year for chronic rhinosinusitis. I won't go through their methodology, but showed 88% sensitivity, 87% specificity in predicting chronic rhinosinusitis. So their conclusions were that endoscopy alone can diagnose CRS with very high reliability, we do not need to get CT scans routinely in these patients when they meet other cl clinical criteria. Now, what about a normal nasal endoscopy? It's something that doesn't get discussed as much, but it has been studied in a couple studies. So in 2001, Weston Jones looked at 101 patients with facial pain, negative endoscopy, and CT scans. 99 of those patients had a confirmed headache disorder. Flash forward to 2011, Keith and Busaba, 42 patients with normal endoscopies with facial pain compared to a CT scan, negative predictive value of 90% that that facial pain was not due to sinusitis. So this is great preliminary data. We wanted to look at this as well. So here's a study we just submitted. It's not published, but we are presenting it at our national meeting in a couple of weeks. The prospective observational study of 134 consecutive patients with chief complaint of sinus headache or prominent craniofacial pain. Saw me. I do a history and physical, nasal endoscopy, then refer that, uh, those patients to headache specialists who conduct their own examination. We assess for a number of variables, but the ones pertinent to this talk are agreement between the following, craniofacial pain location and positive CT findings at respective sinus locations, and then the concurrence between negative nasal endoscopy and negative CT findings. Very interesting findings here, and uh, I think I alluded to this earlier, but migraine and tension type headache made up three quarters of these, pain, uh, these diagnoses. Interestingly, these patients were referred to me for sinusitis, and yet 5% of them ended up having headache attributed to rhinosinusitis. 90% of them had negative nasal endoscopies. As shown in previous studies, there was poor agreement between subjective craniofacial pain location and positive CT findings, kappa values less than 0.2. Here's an example of how we assessed negative endoscopy and compared it to negative CT. 
And you can see here 80 to 97% concurrence between negative endoscopy findings and negative CT findings uh, is quite impressive. So in my mind, if I have a patient with a negative scope, I don't need to, to scan that patient. I think I know what I'm going to find when I scan that patient for the most part. Now, I've given you a lot of data here. Are you feeling helpless? If so, what about some simple screening methods? Okay, so some may be familiar with this, but it's a great study, Lipton 2013. 563 patients, 27 primary care sites, 12 headache specialists involved. They simply asked three questions. Photophobia, nausea, does it prevent you from doing work or daily activities? If you get two out of three of these, 81% sensitivity, 93% positive predictive value at predicting migraine. Okay, pretty impressive and very easy to do. But you might be thinking, what if you're not concerned about migraine? Well, perhaps another simple screen. This was just published recently. It's based on the SNOT-22 or our cytonasal outcome test, which is our probably our most popular rhinologic quality of life measure. Don't worry, you don't have to learn this. Number, item number 12 is very basic. Facial pain, zero to five. So that's what uh, Ben Blyer and his group out of Mass Ioneer did with this study. So 560 CRS patients versus 164 non-cyanogenic facial pain or headache. When the facial pain score was greater than or equal to three out of five, 88% negative predictive value that that pain was not from chronic rhinosinusitis. Simple, potentially very powerful, needs to be corroborated by other studies, but pretty interesting. Okay, let's take a breather. Now that we're all facial pain diagnosticians, got our brown belts, let's move on to possible treatments. And I mentioned this is going to be brief because I'm not the uh, guru on treating uh, headaches, but uh, there was a systematic review in our rhinologic literature on managing sinus headache. Here's a, a nice table of the highest levels of evidence on treating sinus headache as though it's migraine. You can see level one to two study, uh, sorry, levels one to two evidence, uh, fairly small studies up to 200 patients. But what you see here is just by treating basically with a triptan, we see significant reduction in people's headaches. So this is empiric treatment. Now, potential issues with this, with the migraine trial approach, patients are not necessarily getting a formal headache diagnosis. So you might not know what you're treating. Uh, I do think it's reasonable to try empiric headache therapy for symptomatic relief. Uh, and some people may be very comfortable diagnosing and manage, managing migraine, which is totally appropriate. But if you're uncertain of the diagnosis or you're getting an inadequate response, at that point, it might be worthwhile to consider a neurology or a headache specialist referral. Now, it's beyond the scope of this talk to discuss optimal medical management of different headache entities, because that's a whole other talk in and of itself, uh, probably geared more toward a neurology audience. All right, now you might be wondering, well, I'm a surgeon. What about sinus surgery or facial pain? Uh, evidence is not good. Okay, so nobody's really studied this in the last, honestly, almost a couple decades. But uh, you can see late 90s, early 2000s, people were looking at this, pretty small studies overall. Uh, these were all patients who had prominent headaches or facial pain, failed medical therapy. Then it becomes quite variable how they got included. But you can see the success rates there. Uh, first study there, 80%, then 60%. And the last two studies are interesting in that Terabici showed 94% resolution at two months, but then only 62% at one year. And then the last study there, large sample size, but quite heterogeneous in the patient population. If you had isolated pain, only 20% of people got better with sinus surgery. So, you know, major confounders in all these studies, variable disease, variable extensive surgery, variable outcome measures. So all in all, it's pretty poor evidence. And so we think of sinus surgery as a last resort, we should. Uh, I know I've done one in six years. That's about one in 600 of my sinus surgeries. Uh, I do know anecdotally they were doing well initially, uh, and then they lost a follow-up. So I, don't, I can't actually tell you about that one patient. But uh, So here's what we typically do at Henry Ford. So obviously, I see a lot of these patients before neurology, and I take a thorough history with a headache screen, perform nasal endoscopy at the time of their craniofacial pain. When it's normal or out of proportion to their exam, I refer to headache specialists. I defer all neuroimaging decisions to them. If they fail neurologic therapy, we always, you know, we discuss sinus surgery as a possible last resort. Again, it's happened once in six years, uh, but we're collecting a lot of data, more to come with regard to research. So it's actually pretty exciting. All right, so take home points. When you hear facial pain and pressure, think about the differential diagnosis of headache disorders with rhinosinusitis being uncommon. Isolated pain without sinonasal, other sinonasal symptoms is not sinusitis. Think about that three question migraine screen. I put it in my EMR template, very easy to do and pretty powerful. And then just ask simply how severe, zero to five. If it's over three or three, 
Suspe suspect a headache. Look for other symptoms that could be consistent with a headache. If you have a positive screen for migraine or no other sign of nasal symptoms, headache therapy trial or neurology referral. And then think about the ICHD3 criteria, how many different headaches that could be, uh, and then whether patients need neuroimaging. If you suspect rhinosinusitis, treat as you see fit, but consider ENT referral if no improvement or if you're unsure of the diagnosis. You don't actually need a sinus CT, and you don't need multiple rounds of therapy to prove or disprove whether it's rhinosinusitis. For that ENT referral, I would argue nasal endoscopy is as good as CT without the radiation. Could be a controversial point, but I think we have data to back that. And then lastly here, set expectations with these patients. They, they all have been treated as though they have sinusitis for years and years. I think it's important we highlight this might be sinusitis, but it might not be. The goal here is to get the right diagnosis so we can implement the right treatment. What is that? Well, largely medical therapy for the headache. This may take multiple trials to figure out which type of headache it is. Uh, sinus surgery really should be rarely indicated and only after failed headache therapies. If we get to that point, we have to educate patients on the low evidence levels that exist on sinus surgery resolving facial pain. Now, overall, can't stress this enough. This is a very challenging condition, but if we all try to optimize the diagnosis and management of craniofacial pain, we can make a meaningful impact on patient quality of life as well as healthcare. Thank you very much. Uh, feel free to check out my YouTube channel or have patients check it out. It's purely rhinology. Um, thank you so much.